Hello, and welcome to Chatty AF, the anime feminist podcast. My name is Vry Kaiser. I'm the uh, I'm an editor and contributor at Anime Feminist, and with me today is Amelia, Jax, and Lizzie. And we are back t- with our watch along of Michiko and Hachin. Uh, this week we covered episodes 7 through 12. There's a lot to get to, but before we started, Lizzie, you had something you wanted to clarify from last week's discussion. Yeah, last week Amelia brought up a good um, point about wanting to be specific when it comes to talking about people of color in regards to Michiko and Hachin. Due to my nervousness last of last week, because it's my first podcast, I forgot to mention the in the context of the show, I am referring to black and black brown characters and not non-black Latinos and non-black mestiz- mestizos. Um, and and Latinos and have have a general neutral term, which is everyone has seen the X and and the E. The E I use specifically Latine because. Um, um, folks with disabilities with reading devices have pointed out that it's hard for their devices to like understand the X so they've called for more usage of E so now I use that in regards to when I'm talking about my like when it comes to my identity of Quechua and Mestize so I use that in, in that context but to explain terminologies of what do I mean by non-black Latinos non-black uh, Mestizos it's like you know you can think of like an example of skin-based representation is Gina Rodriguez and J-Lo, but the term Latino itself, which was an, imposed by the French, is mm-hmm. describes folks who are from Latin America and the Caribbean and has a history of colonization from Spain and Portugal and any other European um, country that I'm probably missing in the conversation. In general, Latino and Hispanic are actually problematic terms, but you know, for the sake of the podcast, I'll keep it simple. Lastly, mestizo is a racial category that means mixed race, but refers specifically to people of Spanish, Portuguese, and indigenous descent, who for the most part are assimilated. There are are different and complicated racial categories throughout Latin America and the Caribbean, which was done on purpose to erase black, Afro-indigenous, and indigenous ancestry. It is important to note that in the modern day context that black and Afro- indigenous and indigenous people still face systemic violence in all forms to this day. In general, Latinidad has a vested interest in white supremacy, but for the sake of simplicity, I'll end it here. But from from here on forward, when I'm talking about the show, I'll be specific in my wording when we're talking about characters. So I'll be using black and black brown characters, like in terms of my wording when I'm talking about like folks in the show. For more information, you can check out Kat Laszlo's video on can Latinos benefit from white privilege? Because I feel like she does a good job of dissecting that mess. You know, there are classes and courses on this. I mean, you know, there's so many different racial categories that I it, it will take way longer than two hours to talk about it. But uh, but for this, but for the sake of the show, I wanted to be really specific. So because I was nervous last week, I didn't clarify what I meant. So from from here on forward, I will be using. Uh, black and black brown to describe the characters in the show especially the kids in the the show who um, go through the most marginalization so yeah and i give the mic back to everyone because i don't know where to start with this (laughs) all right so um before we kind of get into the meat of this week's episode i wanted to briefly bring up the fact that one of the projects that sayo yamamoto lists as really influential for her is when she was a storyboarder and episode director on Samurai Champloo, where she was kind of uh, Chuichi Watanabe, uh, Shinichiro Watanabe's protege. Um, and I thought it would be interesting to bring it up because last week, Jax, you spoke specifically about anime's issues with appropriating black culture without having black and brown characters on screen. And, you know, I, I think that's... And Samurai Champloo is very much a series that I think has influenced Michiko and Hachin. Um, Michiko has a lot of you know, influence from Mugen and Samurai Champloo is a show that uses a lot of R&B and hip hop uh, and is also, I think, one of the only series I know of aside of the upcoming Golden Kamui that has a main character who is a Japanese racial minority. Uh, Mugen is, is Ryukyuan. Oh, no. So that was that was something that was just a big thing for me that I noticed with Samurai Champloo, like you were saying. I was really stoked when it first came out. I got into it kind of late. 
because I wasn't quite sure like how I felt about just the complete mashup of appropriation and stuff like that. I really wanted to see like how they were going to make this happen. But also as a Nujibis fan, I'm like, okay, I'm absolutely obligated to see what he has done because I've been a Nujibis fan, been a Nujibis fan for like all my God years. And so when I heard that he was going to be scoring the music, I'm like, all right, let me see how I feel about this. And let me see what they do with it. Because I'm, I'm also a huge history buff. And I love learning about Japanese history and Japanese culture and just everything about it. So I was really excited to see what they did with this. And when I noticed that they made Mugen kind of like, and I mean, this is just something that you see in all anime and manga, no matter what. And it's probably not going to change anytime soon, but I'd like to work towards changing it. Is that you associate brown skin with being kind of the more reckless, rebellious, animalistic one. And when I saw, it was so, I felt a way about Mugen at first. I really did, you know, because at first I thought, oh my God, this guy is really hot. He looks like a badass. Like, he's like, he's bae. I can't get over this. This is great. And he doesn't care. Yada, yada, yada. And then like, I had to kind of like switch modes where I'm thinking, okay, let me dissect his character and let me understand like why it is that I can appreciate his character, but there are some aspects of his character that I can't appreciate because as far as any, ask any black kid, Mugen is black. Mugen is the token black guy. He comes from the Ryukyus, which is just, you know, a prison island, you know, that can be associated with the ghetto and everything like that. That is something that I will say that they did extremely well with in conveying both the similarities of being an outcast within a minority community being part of that same minority community very well i think something that they also did actually you know what as a black person now it's extremely hard to find something wrong with samurai shampoo like i'm talking about like how you feel about like years ago but like now it's just like i think samurai shampoo is a masterpiece in how they were able to so brilliantly convey just the struggles of you know that in fact brown skinned people do face even though mugen was japanese like it's so interesting just to kind of look at that aspect. But something else that I really did look at as far as, you know, comparing Samurai Champloo to Michiko and Hachin was I noticed the similarities between definitely Mugen and Michiko. They are, they use, I, I really, I, I'm going to go ahead and say this. They like to play off black sexuality a lot or brown skin sexuality, however you want to put that. Like, and you look at Mugen, who is like almost a complete sexual deviant, like not even almost, but it's a complete sexual deviant, and that's played off for laughs, <laughs> and I mean, he really is, and that's played off for laughs and everything like that, and that's just, you know, that's, it's a running gag, whereas you look at Michiko, who is a thousand percent sexuality, and I always try and look at how black women's sexuality is portrayed when it is being conveyed by non-black people, like, I want to see how we look at, you know, I want to see how other, well, I already know how other, you know, how other tent groups and races and stuff like that tend to see us. But creatively, I want to know how they view us and if it's any different than the media that you see in the West. God, I hope I answered that question. No, I think that's <laughs> great. I would, I want to talk about that a little bit, though, because it's, mm -hmm. it's interesting to me that you pull up Michiko's sexuality. Because something that really struck me in these six episodes, um, we encounter Rita, mm -hmm. who mm -hmm. Hannah takes as kind of a Michiko surrogate for a little while. And Rita and Michiko go about things in a totally different way, but with the same kind of outcomes. Michiko doesn't use her sexuality to get what she wants, which I hadn't really clocked before until I saw Rita. Actually, she, she kind of does that, even though she's a 10 year old girl, that's what she does. She goes up to this guy and she's being a cute girl and saying, would you mind covering our lunch? I forgot my wallet, kind of playing cute with him. And then she, she gets him to pay for her lunch. Michiko doesn't do that. Michiko threatens people with wrenches. <laughs> and it's just, yeah. it's just a completely different way to go, to go about it. And they both have this kind of fixation on one guy who's not really there for them, but again, in a different way and for different reasons. And I, I thought that parallel was really fascinating. No, I agree with you. Um, I would definitely say that, however, overall in the series so far, Michiko knows she is attractive. She knows actually attractive that's what i mean when i say she knows how to use her sexuality to get what she wants like men have a tendency to just so far just how do i want to say this i don't want to say gravitate i just feel like that's the wrong word they're drawn to they're her. drawn to her exactly and michiko knows yeah. this like i don't think that there's anybody in the series i mean aside from rita that was disturbing to watch i'll admit that yes. was, that was yes. extremely yep. disturbing to watch i'm glad you brought rita up because that was just that was bothersome to watch and it was big turn off moment for me and then I had to kind of sit back and realize why does this turn me off why is it so upsetting because 
Did you realize that as we record this podcast, there are 10 year old girls, if not younger, who are out there doing these things. There are 10 year old girls who are being groomed, 10 year old, you know, brown and black girls who are being groomed to think that this is okay, to feel like that they have to act this way. And I mean, like, just speaking, uh, I'm starting to get a little bit emotional about this, actually. Just speaking yeah. about being a black woman, speaking about sexuality and black women's sordid history, black women and brown women's sordid history with sexuality and how we have never truly been able to own our sexuality and our sexuality has been owned by others. We didn't have control or say. I just feel like that is something that, I think that's probably one of the one of the more bigger triggers for me as I watch this series is just kind of watching it and, and definitely the the scene with Rita was just bothersome I'm just like wow this is like not I, I don't want to say it's not okay because it's not okay but at the same time it's just like let's look at this and examine it but damn I'm uncomfortable I mean it fits into it fits into a narrative that we're quite used to as well the idea of women charming men into paying for things for mm-hmm. them Whereas we, to contrast, I'd say you'd have the scene with Michiko where she walks in and they think she's an escort and she doesn't really do anything with that. She she instantly is like, no, I'm not. I'm going to kick your ass. Yeah. And that I, I really thought for a moment that she was going to play into it and she was going to kind of manipulate the information out of them that she wanted. And that's just not how Michiko does things. And it's yeah, it, it's kind of heartbreaking to that Rita's situation is the far more... Mm-hmm socially accepted Rita's situation is the more common one Rita Rita's whole story the whole I call it the circus art because you know everything involving with the circus was such a trigger a yes. triggering thing but you know like Rita's whole story is just really heartbreaking that you know she likes mm-hmm. you know she likes this guy named Gino but you know Gino doesn't see her in, at light if anything G- out of everything uh, out of everything awful in that whole arc and Gino's the only one that actually sees her as a little kid, right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and, you know, and Rita, and it's heartbreaking to have to see Rita have to, you know, try to dress up more adult. And from what she said, she's had to, she's been practicing how to talk with older men. That mm-hmm. way, Gino can see her <laughs> in a more ad- adult light. And, you know, and it's, throughout the entirety, I was like, wow, that is a lot of dangerous situations to be in because it could have gone so bad for Rita and it doesn't help that you know her, her circumstances are not exactly safe either because we find out that the circus is also involved in child trafficking mm-hmm. you know? exactly you know like it just really it's so hard to see that and when she has that conversation with um, Hana when they're you know they're watching people through the telescope or something like that it's um when she when she's talking about the idea of like asking like a higher being like the statue of maria for for your dreams to come true it, it was just so hard for her for me to see her have to say that at such a young age to like say that um mm. sometimes you know reality you know reality is never works out the way you want it to right and i'm just like shit you know that's that's such a hard thing it was such a hard thing for me to watch have to see this little girl have to come to terms with with herself but at the same time she's still desperate to dream right? mm-hmm. when, you, when we see her go to the statue ultimately with Hana to try to get to have something work out for her and then see her chase after that truck you know and mm-hmm. see her just collapse and just be so heartbroken it's just like uh all of it was just so it was just, it was just so I felt so awful for her I really had to walk away from that this episode afterwards for a bit to get my mind in order yeah and there was there was one more element of her story that was really kind of grounded in reality that was the the guy who decided that he should be with her because he's a nice guy oh that guy that that guy yeah, yeah. and it, you mean the kid you mean the kid like the, the kid that likes her? i mean the kid i mean the kid the guy who's like i'm a nice guy talk me up to her and i'll pay you and she should be with me because i deserve her essentially and oh he was mas i think his name was masao mas oh yeah that yeah i wrote it down masao was such a little shit i mean like he, <laughs> uh, rita, rita, rita tells him straight up like i want nothing to do with you and masao's just like i you're not the one who will end it i will i'm like you know, at such a young age, like, like he's taking ownership of her body, uh, like it to- completely mm-hmm. taking away her, her like, her, for her consent and ownership to herself. And I'm just like, oh my god, you are such a shitty little kid. And they've absorbed these scripts, right? They've absorbed what 
is kind of considered acceptable and normal in society. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like so far, every single guy in, in the show has just been just mi really misogynistic as hell. Even Gino, even though he, even though he looked at Rita as a little girl as she should be, I mean, he still walked away from her, leaving her in a very dangerous environment of the circus where. You know, she could have been trafficked later on. You know, you don't. We don't know, right? So, I uh, like. You know, it's just yeah. It's yeah. The the ending to Rita's arc is. I I do appreciate that with with Masao, it doesn't end on the note that obviously she's going to go back to him and things will be okay that way. Like I appreciate it sidestepping that, but like in general. The ending of Rita's arc is so depressing because she comes up to, to Hachi and is like, oh, I'm sure we'll see each other again. But also, like, I'm sorry, her options are what? Yeah. Yeah. Like, the circus is gone, you know. Where is she going to go? And and that's was always so heartbreaking for me. I mean, on some aspect, like, I do want to believe she'd be okay because, you know, she's a very self-resourceful um, little girl. But that's the thing. She is a child. And mm -hmm. we've seen through, we've seen so far in the show what children have to do in order to survive. And the options are very limited and downright life threatening. And it's, it's just so, it's, it just like takes me out of that moment because at least Hachin has Michiko to look after her. Mm -hmm. But who does Rita have? Like, no one really. And can we talk about that for a second, though? Because I'm. I, this was the first time I got really uncomfortable with the way that Michiko treats Hachin. That first, that, that first episode is episode seven, mm -hmm. when Hachin, like she, she hasn't washed her hair, and she gets a slap for it, and then she says there wasn't any shampoo, and she gets a slap for that, and it felt, it, I don't know, it felt really uncomfortable, but it also felt a little bit out of the blue. It felt a little bit out of character. Like Michiko is violent, but the first six episodes, I don't think we've been kind of led to believe that that's the way she reacts to Hana. So is she just becoming more relaxed around her and, and letting loose a bit more? Or I don't know. It was, and they're building it up now as kind of she hits because she cares. And that's... I mean, I instinctively cringe against like any violence towards kids. Like whenever I have to kind of see it like up mm -hmm. front just because of my past history. And um, mm -hmm. I know that, and it's, it's, okay. So I'm really glad you brought that up because... Something that really bugged me about that is that I was hoping I wouldn't see it, but I saw it, and that is the angry black mother stereotype. Oh my god, um, I talk about this all the time when it comes to black parents and their anger towards their own children, and yet, you know, how they raise children, how they treat children, you know, how many black parents truly feel the corporal punishment is the best way to raise children. And, uh, I mean, yeah, black dads get a rep for not being around, but when it comes to black mothers, the rep is that we are just, we are violent, we are dangerous, we, you know, we're threats to our own kids. And that was something that, you know, that's also something that I'm trying to not really focus on in, you know, watching Michiko, Michiko kind of evolve as far as care for her and everything like that. But I really didn't like the slap. I didn't at all. Like, it was just kind of like a, okay, watching this, watching this, watching this, and then pow, she gets, you know, popped for something completely innocuous and i'm just like well yeah. that's triggering because i mean that's how very many you know that's how i was raised that's how a lot of black people were raised that's why the cycle of violence amongst brown and you know in the brown and black community perpetuates it's because that's how we were raised that's how our parents were raised etc 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 it's like when it when comes along the generation that you know what this isn't okay this may have been how we were raised but listen this is technically what is abuse and that shit is not okay so yeah i don't really agree with the slap i was uncomfortable with that but it's just like is that how she is or you're right is she becoming like more like is that how she just naturally is or is this just kind of a this is something we'll never see again in the series because i've yes. seen it once we're going to see it again it's just a matter of when and i hope we don't but that's just kind of like how i'm feeling like it's going if we see something like that again it's just not a matter of it's just a matter of time yeah it, it's it's a, it's a really sour upsetting scene and i think part of the lo quote unquote the, the logic behind it is that Yamamoto loves you know relationships that don't fit necessarily into any mold and so Michiko and Hachin's relationship goes back and forth between are they sisters are they friends are they mother and child it, but it, it I don't and Michiko is like learning to navigate violence gets her what she wants and other things but clearly you cannot and should not do that with a child but I still think it's a really unpleasant scene 
uh, it's a good thing you brought it up because to be honest with you i didn't really think too much about it maybe that's because i'm I, i'm used to i'm used to seeing that kind of parenting or like or emo- like parents being emotionally like uh, manipulative in order to get kids to do what they want but yeah you're right it's really it's, it's just really disturbing to to see that and how much i feel like maybe it's normalized on some on some level at least with me and how like like because that's an old school like that's an old school way of thinking but i have heard and seen instances when like you know in order like in order for i I think somebody put it in a really good way for me is like to beat the bad out of the child like Mm. it's not like like i I don't know like i had this discussion once with a friend about how there's a difference between that and like an actual child abuse where a lot of the violence comes based on cruelty and a lot of and and some and a lot of how i guess immigrant parents like i can speak on that at, on that level how like when they do hit their kids it's based it's based out of like beating out the bad out of the child and, and like you know it's like it's a, it's a fucked up mentality but i do see where that what that come where that comes from and i and i know it's something like seeing like i have nieces and nephews now like they're being raised very differently compared to how let's say i was raised and my sisters were raised right but it's something i'm still trying to work work through because it's not it's cringeworthy it's cringeworthy to watch but um now that you bring it up but i i don't know i just find it interesting how come i didn't realize that uh, until Mm. amelia brought it up you know so Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah my parents didn't didn't hit they didn't hit at all and as a result when I see something like that I mean I I flinch every time I see children being hit on screen because I'm not used to it so it's it's I think your background absolutely has a lot to do with it and the the idea of kind of hitting children as being in any way positive like I I feel really resistant to that idea yeah yeah. even yeah it's it's a tough one. It's a tough one. Oh yeah, no, it's a, it's not acceptable, definitely, mm-hmm. and um, and it's a, it's a, it's a weird line because like even now, like in regards to you know having to raise, in the context of raising kids now, like uh, a lot of like um, I'm seeing a lot of elders try to interject and in how like some of some of the relatives I have on how they're raising their kids, especially like boys that fall out of line, like um, there there's a really a lot of internalized misogyny i find and like and like in order to like in reco- like i'm seeing it a lot in terms of like community and families like like trying to instill this idea of like getting boys to shape it up and like instilling them a really toxic sen- toxic sense of masculinity and that's not okay and i don't support it mm. but i don't know it's a, it's um it's just uh, when it comes to hitting, there's a lot of layers to talk about when it comes to hitting kids because I feel like there's a lot of power dynamics happening there about what is acceptable, what isn't acceptable, and what you want the child to learn and what you w- don't want the child to learn in regards to uh, whatever values the parents have. Toxic masculinity seems like a good door into talking about Satoshi some. Yeah, let's do that. How are y'all feeling? This this is the first time we've really gotten a chance to to see him, as opposed to just hearing him talked about. Ooh, Satoshi, we get a flashback too. We do, a, a considerable chunk of them. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I had really been kind of interested in seeing him. Like, finally, I'd been excited to see him finally come to screen. Like, I was able to finally put a face to the stories and everything that had been talked about him. You know what? I don't want to say there was a lot said because there was just like. It was sprinkled. It was kind of sprinkled throughout. So I was really, I was really looking forward to seeing him appear on the screen. And um, it was, uh, oh God, I want, I, I don't want to call him a bastard. I don't want to call him a bastard, <laughs> but he's a fucking bastard. He's that best friend, quote unquote, best friend. That's I feel like I, I just one sentence describes him. It's a uh, bros before hoes. And that's exactly what I thought about him. That's what I thought about his personality, just because of his hatred for Michiko and just feeling like, you know what? You know, if anything goes wrong in my best bro's life, it's because of the woman in his life. And I'm just like, you know what? I know too many people like him, and it's just like, he's such a piece of work. He really is. Yeah, he's 
he's just an asshole. I mean, I don't know how... Like, I mean, there's definitely things to talk about with him. I mean, his hatred for Michiko and his and everybody's weird fascination with Hiroshi, like, you know, Hana's dad. Mm-hmm. Um, like, oh, God, like, you know, I'm gonna get, I'll get into that later. But with, with Satoshi's backstory, like, it, I don't know. I was reminded when I see that and I think of Rita's situation, I think about how limited options, like, you know, black and black brown children have in the show. And... Um, in, in Satoshi's case, I mean, like he had like his idea of surviving the streets were, you know, killing off Manabe, the head, the leader of the of uh, the gang in that area where he grew up, and uh, obtaining power in that and dominating over everybody. And I don't know, like I think throughout all of that, I'm thinking, wow, this is a little kid ta- saying all of this, mm-hmm. right? And he has an and it says something about his situation when he was a child that he had no other recourses or options to fall back on but to obtain this position of power by by force if need be and in this case you know that means murdering like adults twice his age and you know if anything I'll yeah he's a, he's he's a mess but I'll give him credit I'll give him some credit I mean he you know he obtained power I mean I didn't even know like uh, he was the one who orchestrated everything that happened in the show with Michiko landing in prison with um, with uh, finding out who murdered that other boss like uh, of the Phantasma I think that's the name of the gang yeah sure I'll go mm. with that but <laughs> but uh, yeah I was just surprised to, to see how much he really orchestrated all of this and um, and yeah, I mean, I'll give him that at least. But other than that, like his immense hatred for Michiko is always really like something that's really that leaves a sour note for me. And, and I think you'll see that later in the show. But yeah. And also everyone's weird fascination with Hiroshi just really. Uh... It's interesting to me that they spend almost an entire episode with fake Satoshi before showing us the, the real one. It I almost get the feeling that they want that uh, they're trying to draw a distinction between this fake Satoshi who is who is pulling all of this this posturing violent action as opposed to the real Satoshi who is a bastard. But we've also we're also spent given like a lot of time digging into the environment that forced his hand and made him somewhat into this person. Mm-hmm. That feels like the trajectory of that narrative and that that uh, comparison. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, no, he's def he's definitely smart. Like I think when I think of uh, we see fake Satoshi and this and real Satoshi, there's definitely this bi- this um this distinction was made to show that Satoshi is actually a really intelligent guy and he has his hands on a very powerful um, organization behind him, right? So um, I'll give him that, but yeah, I don't want to give him too much credit either because like I I, yeah. I don't like him that much. <laughs> You know, he's a total fucker. Yeah, yeah he's, a total, he's a total ass. But uh, but I'm trying to be fair. But it's uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Fake fake Satoshi. His name was uh, Davi. Is that right? Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. And they just had that. They had that really cold throwaway line in the open. It's the next episode saying, "Oh yeah, his body was found." And mm-hmm. that it was that. I think that's something that Mitch Con Hatchin has been quite consistent with is it'll show you these characters that'll flesh them out and might even make some kind of comedy out of them but the the reality is quite cruel and mm-hmm. it's quite throwaway and we have that as well with Pepe's story mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. and it's I, I kind of don't expect people to have happy endings at this point so I'm not sure what lies ahead for, for Michiko herself and for Hachin I it's it's starting to feel a little bit darker than I expected going into it. Yeah, I mean it's really hard to. Sorry to be a downer, guy. Oh no. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> no, it's not. I mean it's really hard to feel optimistic considering all everything the characters go through and and all just the, the ugliness involved. Even okay, I'm gonna bring this up since I'm delaying it. Is um the the, the, fa- the fascination with like everyone has this fascination with Hiroshi. And I, when I see that fascination with him, I'm reminded in the circus arc when uh, we find out that you know child trafficking is happening. Like there's the other Michiko, um, who is uh, 
who is also equally fascinated with Hachin because unlike the other children, she's white and fair-skinned. Oh right? my gosh, yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. like, it's just for me, when I look at both like Michiko and Satoshi, when I think of Hiroshi and then I think of this other Michiko who mm-hmm. um, is so fascinated with, with her, with Hachin and how she very much ignores the other black and black brown children in her care. And just seeing her touch her and like in the balloon when they're escaping and like saying, you're so fair, you're so beautiful. Like she's going to catch a high price, you know, and it just it's just like, oh, God, this sinister. It's just so disturbing to see how much uh, how much whiteness is desired in the show. Right. And even in the the child trafficking business, we, is it, we, just, we see that it's often white children that sell at a higher price than black and black brown children and uh it's it's just so disturbing to see and this is why i kind of uh <coughs> developed a different opinion of director azalea mm. like earlier in the show i mean i don't think she's a great person either but and it, c- <laughs> it could be also like the kids just don't uh, the black and brown children black and black brown children don't sell at a higher price but i c- also felt like she kept those kids in her care because even though their options in life are very limited, at least their op- their options compared to whatever awful fate lies for the children who are who are trafficked, right? I think this is this is a big t- topic that could go a lot of ways. Uh, but as long as we're talking about the, the other Michiko, I think this show rides a really fine line with maybe my biggest problem with with Yamamoto's work that yeah. I, I I see her kind of slowly getting over. But it's boy, it's pronounced and uncomfortable here is this this coding of beauty as goodness is just kind yes, of in there. Yes. Uh, like, holy yes, shit. Uh, <laughs> like like other Michiko, there's there's the sh- the shot of her as a young as a young model, and it's just so like it could have been this this idea of ah uh, she was trafficked and now she is perpetuating that cycle but then that's never gone into so it comes across as she used to be hot but now look at her she's a fat uggo no. and i just please <laughs> stop <laughs> and show <Yeah. laughs> i will go ahead and say that and this is just something that i pay i i noticed i'm so glad you brought that up because it really <laughs> does play off of the fact that let's look at it this way the most desirable people in the show our ten, our children, oh. the most desirable people in that show sexually, are children, yeah. and it's horrifying. Because yeah. It gives mm-hmm. off the message: Hey, the older you get, the uglier you get, and the older we're not gonna want you once you're old and used. It's just like, so you mean to tell me that these children who are exposed to horrific life experiences, who you guys consider attractive, like I shudder to think. I just hate thinking. Tra- I just hate thinking about child trafficking in general. Yeah. Mm-hmm. When you think about the fact that, oh my God, listen, Hannah's being praised. Oh my God, you're so pretty. That's why I always cringe when you get these old ass dudes in real life or anything. And oh, think, oh yeah, you're gonna be real pretty when you grow up. I'm like, can you please not look at my five year old niece or what have you? That's so <gasps> creepy. Literally, all I hear you telling me is that you cannot wait to fuck this five year old when she's 18, which isn't in that many years. But this is literally what I'm hearing. You want to get her when they're young and vulnerable and impressionable and then you oh am i saying too much i'm sorry i get rude no 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 it's not at all no it's it's fair this, it's fair because this is I, worth being rage at yeah because i think i've been in pro i've been in proximity to like men like this like there's this there's this pr- this child i knew back when i was visiting a relative in bolivia mm-hmm. and oh my god like i've been in proximity of men like that who were lusting after her from like age appropriate to like fucking 30 oh my god i know it's like i have been like that in my family and it disgusts me i'm just y'all do know this is not okay right it's just it's disgusting because eventually when one of these assholes were called out and thankfully reported he was like he the excuse was like he thought he was like you know he thought she was 16 i'm like that doesn't make it better that doesn't make it better at all first of all wait a second that is (laughs) never an excuse You, yeah. you know, uh, you know, and it's just like, you know, and all these, all these, oh, it was just really gross. And on top of that, this fascination a lot of these guys had that she was very white passing too was, uh, uh, it was just so gross to see. It's like, oh gosh, it was, I've been in proximity to like men like that. And it's really disgusting to see. And it's, it's awful. And yeah. How old is Bichiko supposed to be? At least 
I would guess that she's supposed to be in her late 20s, given the timeline, yeah. the time frame, if we assume she was young when she met Hiroshi. Because we have, I mean, it's not, she's not a child, but there was the, um, the other light-skinned character of these six episodes was the hairdresser, Anastasia. Oh, yes! And we have this whole, yeah, we have this whole situation where her kind of philandering husband, um, he, flirted. he pursues Michiko. <sighs> I mean, he doesn't just flirt, does he? He actively, yeah. like, she, he tells her, I'm going to come to your room. I'm going to knock. If you don't answer, I'll take the hint. That is not what happens. He just walks straight on in there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's, yeah, that was, that was like, whoa. But then there's this moment a, a little bit later when he's, he, he says something like, should I stop or something? And she's like, I don't know. And I thought, okay, at least there's a consent check-in. But it seems like he's got this, he's got this white wife basically who yeah. she's quite clear on the deal between them it seems he, he he likes to be pursued himself he likes to be kind of caught and kind of i don't know reconfined or whatever that seems to be his deal but he's he leaves his book well, he doesn't leave his wife he pursues michiko who seems to be younger than his wife i just got that impression from the way they were drawn mm -hmm. so it's it's I don't know. That seemed to be one story where they were kind of expressing this dynamic a little bit. I am literally rocking back and forth because I could not wait to talk about Anastasia and Michiko. I could not <laughs> wait. That was at the top of my list. I was waiting for this. Do it. Excellent. So it. it's on my it's on my list. God, just Go where to begin? Okay, first of all, I think the one thing that bothered me more than anything seeing Anastasia. You really feel bad for her because you know she is this white woman who is absolutely. You know what? Let me let me go ahead and phrase this another way. Uh, and one that people actually might be able to understand. Everybody knows the Starfire, Dick Grayson, and Barbara Gordon dynamic, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> like, I like that everybody laughed. <laughs> um, so I didn't really pay attention to this until maybe early of last year. But every time I see that dynamic, I think of the uh, old, not even old, but very true stereotype of white women being afraid to lose their significant other to an exotic woman. There was a horror there was a horror movie that surrounded this whole trope of oh my god, my usually white husband is with this brown black girl. I'm about to lose my fucking mind. Like that that there was an entire movie about it. I couldn't believe it. And it was real recent, like 2007 or something like that. Right, this feels like one. Oh my know. god. <laughs> you will get the biggest <laughs> kick out of this movie. Oh my god. I need to see, I need to see this. Oh gosh, but <laughs> It, it it sounds like a number of movies I've heard of, but again, there there are many of them. So the trope that's something that something that you will always notice within things like this is that you've got the white wife, and then you've got okay. Let's talk about let's talk about that let's talk about that stereotype from the get go. No matter what, I mean, who who saw Django Unchained out of sheer curiosity? I I yes. did, yeah, I, I did. I couldn't do it just because I just couldn't. <laughs> just like I I have feelings about that movie, but for the most part. I'm like thumbs up because I mean it was just ridiculous but um you notice that um the landowner or what it what, what was what was candy. candy yeah whatever is the Calvin Candy Leonardo DiCaprio's mm -hmm. character his sister was constantly trying to go after the doctor who was white but the doctor kept shafting well not shafting her but you know kept like pussy putting her off in favor of Brunhilde for obvious reasons but the fact that you know Something that I really like about this dynamic, sorry, I just completely, just my thoughts were just completely scattered. Um, something that I really do like about this <laughs> dynamic, something that I really do appreciate with Anastasia and Michiko, was that it does point to the fact that when it comes to uh, interaction between black women and white women, particularly in matters of love and relationships and stuff like that, you've got the dynamic of, well, actually, you know, I'll go ahead and say this flat out, and this is going to be very blunt. But Anastasia is honestly the type of white women that a lot of black men go for. She's, and this is just from my experiences, and I promise you, if I ask other black women, you know, you will get a very close response to this. But the one thing I noticed about Anastasia is that she is exactly the type of white women, or white woman, that black men will say, you know, will say, will use against black women, so to speak. Like, you know, I, uh, you know, black women are too independent. Black women are this, black women are that, you know, black women don't know how to act. Black women are too strong. Black women are da 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 And so then you've got Anastasia here who is literally the walking embodiment of how very many, oh God, how do I say this? About that submissiveness in white women that black men desire, that is Anastasia. So the fact that she was 
quote unquote threatened by a much younger Michiko and uh, who was also a woman of color. So of course she's exotic and different. I don't know. I just thought that she was a very interesting character. Like, and I felt really bad for her and a couple of mm -hmm. things on a couple of stances, like way more than I expected to feel bad for, to be perfectly honest with you. But the fact that she's <laughs> very, uh, I guess not so much understanding, but just complacent of it. It's just like, girl, I just hate that that dynamic was just played at, so to speak. Right. Well, I think there's an, a motif that's brought up in this episode that keeps recurring throughout the series that I actually really wanted to talk about is this is the, uh, it was in Pepe Lima's episode as well, is this idea that there are constantly um, novelas, or is there a different term in, in Brazil? Um, but, but soap operas. Yeah, no, novellas is generally the term used everywhere, but people will get what you're talking about. Yeah, novellas are really long, but and, and over dramatic, but yeah. Gotcha. Um, but but yeah, like soap operas or movies or things on the TV are given a lot of prominence, and it's as though this uh, there's this I or like when um, Michiko is kicking Davi's ass, and there's this kung fu movie in the background that deliberately mirrors her shots, and there's this idea that these characters' lives are imitating what they've seen on television and what, what these these narratives they're given so you have this this woman who is well this you know the soap opera is is the philandering man and the patient woman who and but eventually he'll come back and so you know i guess i'm mirroring that in real life and perpetuating this and i find that a really interesting dynamic especially with the focus on hiroshi who is this character who might as well not even be real he is what people want or need him to be in in their lives yeah, and I think um, typically novellas in general have a happy ending, right? I mean, they're really mm -hmm. long and over tr over the top, and there's a lot of vi violence, sexual violence in particular, in a mm -hmm. lot of novellas that people don't really like to point out and talk about, mm -hmm. in particular towards like Black, Afro-Indigenous, and Indigenous characters in, in novellas. But mm -hmm. typically they have a happy ending and the happy ending is always like oh that that marginalized character has assimilated to a higher class right and mm -hmm. and um for me when yeah like i was thinking a lot about michiko in this in these episodes where she so like she so desperately wants to believe like hiroshi loves her or still loves her right like you have mm -hmm. um that philandering husband his name is bruno um, there's Bruno who, you know, asks him, asks her point blank, like, do you think that, uh, that, uh, he, he loves you? And then later on when she's sick and is having hallucinations, thanks to that very fake, very fake doctor, like, you know, she's almost having like, I feel like a panic attack, the, like imagining the reality of like, what if Hiroshi like doesn't even love me and actually has moved on, right? Like, like Michiko so desperately is like wants to have a happy ending because you know as we've seen so far in the show reality is so much harsher for a lot of the characters to bear with right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so i don't know that's what i think of when uh when you brought that up so thanks for that right i mean i saw this this one actually i saw it as showing michiko as being kind of more romantic than i would have expected um that that whole episode that really resonated with me. I think where she, I don't know. I th I don't think Michiko's ever been so relatable to me as when she's in this position where she's like, I feel one way, but I don't know how to act, and I'm not sure if I'm doing the right thing. And why did I come out here and see if he was here? I didn't want to do that, and she's just kind of confused and not sure how to deal with it. But she ends up kind of just doing what feels right at the time. And she's she says these things in there, like, what, imagine if you were like a fish and you could just do whatever you wanted all the time. And I was like, don't you already? <laughs> she, <laughs> but she doesn't, like, she feels like she's got this kind of mission to find Hiroshi and that he's kind of the one. And she's built him up now as this, this, this kind of almost like a myth. So if he is dead or if he is with somebody else, I'm not quite sure how she'll cope. And this is the first time we really see her kind of going outside that possibility herself. And I thought that was quite nice, actually, that we do see her considering stepping outside those boundaries a bit rather than just staying fixated on this guy that she's been sort of focused on for the last, how, what, 10 years mm -hmm. or something? Yeah, yeah, 10 years or so. But, but yeah. feeling really guilty about it at the same time yes. because this is not the narrative. This is not the love story. She has to go after exactly. him and be singularly devoted. And how dare she not <laughs> want to hang on to this guy who may be dead? Yeah. 
Like, it, it <laughs> hurts to see her, like, be angry at herself for something she shouldn't be angry at herself mm-hmm. for. I loved it. I absolutely loved it. Like, there are so many times when Michiko has been quite <clears throat> unrelatable yeah. for me, I think. Whereas this episode, I was like right there with her. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I would feel the same as you, Michiko. And it was, and the, the fact that she's, she's so hard edged, you know, she's so kind of worldly wise and she just kind of uses violence to get what she wants. And this guy just, there's something about him that draws him, draws her to him. And she said this about Hiroshi as well, when they go and see this guy that she thinks is Hiroshi based on her street art. And she's like, that's not him. You can't replicate that cool. And she clearly has this this kind of aura that she's attracted to, this kind of cool swagger. And Bruno has that. Mm. And she, as soon as she's just around that, they don't exchange a single word. They just, they have that cigarette exchange and don't say anything. And then when he does talk to her later and he's like, I love you, Michiko. And that clearly is enough to sway her. And it was just such a beautiful character episode. I really appreciated it. Yeah. And I don't think we... I don't think we've talked much about Hachin, but I think this is where um, I started to appreciate more of her character a little. That I like that she sees that Michiko is clearly hurting, like she's vulnerable. She, you know, she's desperately wanting this happy ending for herself. But I like that um, seeing how Hachi sees that in her and wants to take care of her. Because, you know, Michiko go, goes through a lot of awful things. I mean, she gets beat up. I mean, the amount of violence she goes through in these in these six episodes is so much to bear for me. But yeah, I, mm-hmm. I appreciate that even though Hachi shouldn't have to do it to take care of the adult in her life because that's just putting a lot of pressure on her. But mm-hmm. I do appreciate seeing this different type of love coming from Hachi to Michiko. I don't know. I feel like Michiko needs that in a way, way more than... Uh, that she is the romantic love that she's chasing after. I really, yeah, I really appreciated Hachin's character in these episodes too, but from a slightly different perspective. Like I like that she was kind of angry with Michiko and she's she's not really afraid mm-hmm. to express that. When, which when you consider her upbringing where she was in this environment where she couldn't speak out for so many years and mm-hmm. she couldn't really express anger, she wasn't free to do that. And now she's in the situation with Michiko where she can be quite open when she's frustrated and when she's she's furious. And even when it doesn't seem reasonable or like she's she's not afraid of repercussions, even though she gets them sometimes. And it's it's I don't know how to say it because it's still not quite a healthy relationship, but it feels like she's moving in the right direction. Yeah, I mean, they're Mm -hmm. still getting to know each other. I've been keeping time of a. of how long they've gone to know each other. This series started in March, and so far at the end of this, these episodes, it's like the end of April. So yeah. so it's like two months so far in the context of the show that um, that they've, they've traveled and gotten to know each other. So they are opening up. It's not healthy, but, you know, at least, like, um, it's going somewhere, you know? Because, mm-hmm. um, what's her name? Alexandria, uh, like that, you know, that lady... Well, mm. she was really being passive aggressive with with Hachin, but I think she brings up an interesting point when she was washing her hair about how oh Anastasia yeah Anastasia okay her name is Anastasia yeah. okay when she was washing her hair that um, that oftentimes the people who are the most closest to each other fight often and meanwhile mm. her and her husband haven't fought in years mm-hmm. right I mean mm. I mean granted I didn't like that she was saying all these passive ag- aggressive things to a child but okay <laughs> but I just thought that was an interesting thing to note mm-hmm. like I don't it's not a, yeah. it's not healthy it's not a healthy relationship but it's going somewhere that's hopefully mm-hmm. going to be much more healthy than what we see now but I question how healthy Anastasia is. <laughs> <laughs> no, well. oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not sure that should be held up as aspirational. <laughs> no, no, no. Like, no, no, no. I meant like uh, for Michiko and Hachin. Like uh, that relationship will hopefully be much healthier than whatever they, whatever Gino and Al. And although I mean, you know, I'm saying that, but at the same time, there was an element of me once. Once Anastasia said he likes it, he he actually wants me to go and scoop him up in my net. And I thought, oh, is that that's just how your relationship works. Okay. And as long as both partners kind of understand that's the deal and are somewhat comfortable with it, um, who am I to judge? But it's, I, I, I didn't get a read from these episodes of how true that is, but she seemed to clock very quickly that Michiko was someone that her husband would be interested in. 
And while she seemed surprised to see the cigarettes in Michiko's room, she didn't react to it in a way of somebody who was mm -hmm. kind of not encountered the situation before, I guess. Mm. So it's, I, I don't know, maybe that's, that's kind of their pattern. Maybe that's just the relationship they have, in which case, yeah, I guess that's as healthy as anything. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. I just, I, I strive, I hope for Michiko and Hachi to have a way better relationship than whatever, <laughs> like, yes, happy relationship, yes. whatever happy relationship, <laughs> whatever relationship Anastasio and, um, Anastasia and uh, Bruno have, so. I, I was structurally really glad that they spend a lot of this six episode stretch apart, because one of the things yeah. I find really important in these, these characters are thrown together and they learn to rely on each other's stories is I like for there to be a break where they then have to choose to seek out each mm -hmm. other's company. I, I think that's really important to breaking, starting over and having it be more open and chosen. And also like Hachin is one of those characters where it's on the one level you realize, yeah, she's a child and she's angry and she's sometimes irrational because she's a child and of all she's been through. But at the same time, Sometimes she's really obnoxious and just there to be the stick in the mud, virtuous kid who yells at Michiko for just trying to live her <laughs> life. And it's great to see her get away from that, which yeah. I, I feel like is the goal of the circus arc. Although I kind of wish, I, I completely take your point, right? Although I kind of wish that when Hachin chose to be with Michiko at the end, it was because of something more positive than literally escaping yeah. child trafficking. Yeah. 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 Uh, it's... <laughs> it would have been nice if she'd been in a somewhat stable situation and actually Michiko was somebody she wanted to spend mm -hmm. time with actively. But we didn't mm -hmm. quite get that. But we did get that vice versa. Like Michiko does now think of her relationship with Hannah as very important to her. I think that we've really seen that come out in the last set of episodes and in these sets of episodes. So that's, I mean, that's really nice to uh, see as well. I just uh, want to throw in real quick, Michiko uh, Hachi's relationship uh -huh. reminds me kind of um, Misato and Shinji's from Evangelion. Oh. Yeah, yeah, a little bit. Yeah, just in the that. sense that she's that. trying to balance kind of, am I a parent? Am I a sister? Like, what am I to her? Like, I don't know. That was just something that I noticed. Plus, they both dress like in red and they're both kind of wild type. So I don't know. It's interesting. <laughs> I'd, I'm very curious to see where this goes because the one thing I do I would like to see is kind of a uh, I almost said a happy end but I mean there really can't be a happy end of the show I just don't see it <laughs> yeah uh, it's it's hard I mean can we talk about Atsuko yes I, yes I, I was yes. going to insist that we talk about Atsuko before we go because we're going a little long but yes let's it, please, I love please, her please, please, so please. much please let's let's talk about her because I love her and I hate Ricardo I love Ricardo <laughs> It's, it's so interesting to me that, like, you know, after this, uh, Yamamoto went on to do The Woman Called Fuchiko Mine, which, of all the things I love about that show, Zenigata is easily the weakest part. And here is Atsuko, who is, who is very much in that mold of the dogged inspector who is, prob who is definitely totally in love with the person they're pursuing, who, like, uh, consumes their life. My favorite, well, my favorite stretch of her with with her is kind of coming up, but I'm just, my heart is so continually broken by this <laughs> stretch where... Where she like she faces consequ the qu consequences for this, which is ab abnormal for her character archetype. Like she loses her job, and we spend a lot of time with like cracking that that sort of thin veneer ice that she was living on, where she was a professional, but there was so much you know racism and sexism in, in her position that just waiting to come for the chance to come up and undermine her, and then her feelings for Michiko uh, like are what do her in, but she doesn't. She does and doesn't seem to regret that. And oh my God, she's just so good. <laughs> I did wonder actually, like, which the consequences that she faced, there was a part of me that was like, mm, is it because she's a black woman? Mm. Is, that, is that why she's experiencing this mm. kind of weight of consequences? I, would, a, would a more senior white man have got away with stuff like Never. that? I don't know. And, uh, Never. Uh, yeah. And Ricardo got in the end. If you like, you mentioned earlier how we find out in the next episode via news what happens to all these other characters. Yeah, Ricardo got like a promotion and he got mm -hmm. credit for whatever bust that yeah. they did in the last episode. And well, Atsuko, like we're we're told that she's going to be facing consequences of corruption, and it's it's so hard to see because she's such a great character who is very nuanced, layered. She's clearly in love with Michiko, and that love. And that love is what ultimately, uh, like, allows her t to let Michiko go escape and find whatever answers that she's looking for. But she takes a heat for it, and Ricardo pretty much straights out 
like says it out loud about what he thinks of Atsuko. Like he hates that he's under the command of a younger woman, and、mm-hmm. um, and he's just tired of being her lackey. He has very petty dreams about paying off his mortgage. It's like, <laughs> you know, like there's so much misogyny and shittiness come like from that interaction. I didn't honestly, I didn't think he was going to be a relevant character when I first watched this.、Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. What? But yeah, he took me by surprise, and you know, like, but Atsuka wasn't didn't look that surprised either. Like, I, she probably has known something like this was gonna happen. Like, folks had their like folks are out to like undermine her, demote her, because she's pretty high ranking in the police force. I think. I, I don't. But then <clears throat> we have to. But then we have to raise the point that she didn't actually do her job. She raised all these these forces to go and. Arrest Michiko, and then she has the opportunity, and she lets her go. And like that's, <laughs> I think that's really frustrating. Is like she's actually in the wrong, so she does. I think she gets much worse consequences than she deserves. But she definitely, like in a way, they were kind of right to suspect that she wouldn't do the job right. And you know, there's a conflict of interest there. She grew up with Michiko. Why would people expect that she could kind of stare down her childhood friend and arrest her? I I don't know why they've put her that in that position or why she's ended up in that position, but I'm. It, it wouldn't be surprising to me that people would doubt or question whether she'd be able to do the deed when the time came. It, it is interesting to see her as a foil to S- Satoshi as well.、Mm-hmm. Uh, th- these two characters who have known, e- you know,、um, who have known this other person since childhood and have risen to the heights of some kind of structure of power and found it to be. A very precarious place that wasn't as fulfilling as maybe they'd hoped it would be. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they. I think Satoshi and Atsuko actually knew each other. I mean,、mm-hmm. they 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 called through each other via fo- cell phone. So、mm-hmm. it's um、uh, it's frustrating. It's frustrating to see that you know, like Atsuko probably worked really hard to get where she's at, and you know, for that to be challenged, and of course. You know her personal feelings involving Michiko has put her in a really, in a situation where I don't know if she can come back、mm-hmm. from that, right? And she's also put her connections with, uh, with um, like the like Satoshi and other folks she might know in the community in jeopardy too. So yeah, it's it's a, her her arc is so like it seems to hang very much on this sense of like how much. Does this bond mean to her, and is there anything there? Because this is a series about past versus present versus, you know, what do you choose to let go? What is harmful? What is helpful to you? And it it hurts to think that that Michiko maybe doesn't actually value this bond, but knows that Suko does. Yeah, I I hope we see more of that in the future to see what exactly. Like how Michiko actually views their relationship, because you know Atsuko has given up so much for her thus far, you know, and I hope that I hope in some level that that feeling is reciprocated. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Which,、uh, so I guess to, on that note, what are you guys hoping for in the next? We'll actually be watching five episodes next time since this is twenty-two episodes instead of twenty-four. So what are your hopes? I <clears throat> excuse me. Oh my gosh, I just hope to see. <laughs> Oh God, I, I want to see, just more growth. I want to see, I want to see Hana be a kid. I want to really see Hana be allowed for at least five minutes to be a kid because I just don't see Hana and I don't see a kid. I see a,、uh, I see an adult in、mm-hmm. like、uh, however Hana is old is supposed to be. Like I want to see more of that、yeah. obnoxious child, like impiness, <laughs> and I want to see Michiko let Hiroshi go. I'm like, girl, you are literally holding on to him, and just I, I was happy to see the break, but I just want to see her let go of him, like for good, like because it is clear that she has no other goal in life. Upsetting. Like, I get、yes. that you want to be happy. Yes, I understand that you want to be happy, but at the same time, like, I I hate that she is so focused on him. Like, I don't even mean focused. I mean、mm-hmm. she is obsessed. Whatever is stronger than obsessed is what Michiko is, and I want to see like I just want to see like more growth, and I just want to see a bit more justice in this show. I'm asking for a lot given what we've always already been talking about, but I want to see a somewhat, even if it's bittersweet to an end, I want to kind of just see closure out of this series, because I mean for everything this series is taking me through emotionally and mentally, everything I have to assess and break down and just you know in general, it's just like I'd like to see some kind of balance over the next couple of episodes. 
where we know it's going to go right. But at the same time, I don't want to lose the excitement of not knowing what's going to happen. What about you, Lizzie? Oh, yeah. I mean, in general, I'd like to see all the kids in the show be allowed to be children. And um, yeah, like I hope to see a more healthy relationship between Michiko and Hachi. And I want Michiko to start seeing that there are other more important relationships in her life that she can hold on to than this idealized relationship she is imagining with Hiroshi. I, I'd like for her to see that that's not healthy and that she should let him go. And I, I hope that that's done in a way that's psychologically healthy for her because we've seen how, how, not, how she, didn't really, really, she didn't really react well at the idea of Hiroshi being with someone else. So I'd like to see more of that. I'd like to see more of Atsuko. I want to see those two develop more. Yeah, so I'm hoping for a bittersweet ending. Like I, mm. I you know, so that's as much as I can hope for with this show. <laughs> How about you, Amelia? I think character growth is the big one for Michiko and Hachin specifically. I mean, we've started to see Michiko rub off on Hachin a little bit when she decides to go after the, the fake doctor with like a pipe <laughs> and just like vandalize her way out of her bill. So Michiko's starting to rub off on Hachin a little bit. That shot is so um, good. <laughs> but it would be nice to see that work vice versa as well. Like Hachin has made her thoughts very clear to Michiko that she's not happy with kind of just threatening their way out of money ironically um and she's she would like to to see Michiko kind of conduct herself more ethically she'd like to see she'd like to just it seems like she'd like to kind of enjoy traveling around with her a bit more and right now she's tense she's stressed and she's frustrated and that's why she's so angry all the time so it would be really nice to see Michiko like be willing to start paying for things for example and work more like we always see Hachin taking on these jobs and like part-time jobs wherever they go just to earn some cash and Michiko doesn't seem to do that so maybe that's that's a change we'll get to see but it would I also really want to see more of Atsuko now that she's got this pressure off her I mean for anyone who's seen Avatar Last Airbender it's like when Zuko walks away from the military mm. and it's like oh yes. yeah you get to see who you are uh, brilliant yeah. like that's that's what I want I think there's I've got anime examples too but I can't remember any of them off the top of my head so Zuko it is <laughs> But I really want to see more of Atsuko, like get to know her better. I do hope Satoshi comes back. I want to see more of him and dig into their history a bit more between the three of them. Also, also I want to add for all the mm -hmm. listeners out there, please don't go to a doctor referred to you by two. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I just I, I just want I just want to emphasize. Yeah, there are folks who like, you know, who do curan curandismo and like santeria. But the thing is to find those folks it takes a lot of work to find legit folks. Don't listen to tourist guides. Don't go to the wishes <sighs> market if you plan on visiting South, South America and the Caribbean. Those are often places to scam tourists. Finding like folks who know what they're doing actually takes effort. So, like, just so you know. <laughs> Good to know. Oh, Hannah, she doesn't know any better. <laughs> oh, God, that whole episode. We could, we could be here another like 20 minutes talking about that whole <laughs> fucking thing oh, yeah we didn't even talk about her dream sequence or anything i like, love okay. the good surrealism but ah uh, we're running long <laughs> yes let's, let's curses move on. Okay. but yes uh thank you so so much as always uh to the three of you for being here i this this is i'm really quite proud of the discussion that you that that that, that nope words bad <laughs> uh, I, I, I'm really proud that Anime Feminist is able to put this out, and, and much of that is thanks to the discussion you have brought. So thank you again. I can't say it enough. Yeah, seconded. Yeah. Yes. All right, uh, so let's get to the closing spiel. If you liked this episode, you can find more episodes of Chatty AF on SoundCloud. If you like our, want to hear more from our contributors, including uh, Jacqueline and Lizzie, you can always find us at AnimeFeminist.com. We also have a Patreon, which helps pay the bills. So we're really working on ramping that up to be able to expand what we do, our content, how much we pay our contributors and our editors. 
and to just be able to shore up what we do in the future. That's patreon.com slash anime feminist. Even a dollar a month really, really means a lot. That's kind that's the kind of sustainable stuff that's going to keep us going. As far as social media, you can find us on facebook.com slash anime feminist. Uh, you can find us on Tumblr at animefeminist.tumblr.com. And you can also find us on Twitter at twitter.com slash anime feminist. If you are watching along with us next time, again, we'll be watching five episodes instead of six. So it will be episodes 13 through 18. And we hope to see you there. Take care. <laughs> <laughs>